Hi there everyone, my name is Keke. Have you ever walked on a carpet and felt a shock on your fingertip when you touch someone else? Maybe you have heard crackles while you were brushing your hair before. Did you know that if you sat in front of a mirror and switched the light off, you may actually see sparks jumping from the brush and your hair? These are examples of static electricity in the world around you. Do you remember Thales, the guy who discovered static electricity? You should recall that when Thales rubbed a piece of amber with some wool, he noticed that a small spark jumped between the amber and the wool. In this lesson, you are going to learn about how and why these sparks occur. You will also learn how these sparks are related to lightning. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain how lightning occurs, describe how lightning conductors function, and compare traditional and scientific explanations of lightning. Now, when charges jump from one charged object to another, we see this as a spark and hear it as a crackle. Let me demonstrate. Watch what happens when an earthed, uncharged metal sphere is brought near to the positively charged dome of the van der Graaff generator. Can you see that a spark jumps across the space between the charged metal dome and the metal sphere? As each spark jumps across, you should hear a clicking sound or crackle. This spark is a form of electrical discharge. Negatively charged electrons on the neutral sphere are attracted to the positively charged metal dome. If the attraction is strong enough, they leap across the gap from the sphere to the dome. These electrons move in a stream through the air, heating it up and releasing light and sound energy at the same time. When they arrive on the metal dome, they neutralize the large positive charge there. If the van der Graaff generator is left on, the positive charge builds up on the metal dome again and there is another electrical discharge, and so it goes on. The reason that electrical discharge or spark can occur again and again is that the metal sphere is connected to the earth. This means that negatively charged electrons can move from the earth onto the metal sphere to replace the ones that have jumped across to the metal dome. There is therefore a continuous supply of electrons for the rest of this lesson, I'm going to concentrate on using the evidence from this demonstration to explain the natural occurrence of lightning. I want you to take note of what we learn and use your new knowledge to protect yourselves from the damage that lightning can cause. What do you feel during a thunderstorm? When lightning is flashing in the sky and thunder deafens you, do you feel like hiding somewhere? This is a perfectly natural reaction. Lightning is a dangerous natural phenomenon. People can be killed when they're struck by lightning. But how do we explain lightning? In the middle of the 18th century, the American scientist Benjamin Franklin concluded that lightning was an enormous spark caused by an electric discharge between two charged clouds or between a cloud and the earth. It is thought that clouds become charged when particles in the clouds rub together. Thunder clouds become negatively charged. When they pass a tall object such as a building or a tree, they induce a positive charge on this object. Do you think that you can use what you have learned about induction to explain how this occurs? Why don't you try it before you watch the next animation? Electrons in the object are repelled by the negatively charged cloud and move away from it to the earth, leaving positive charges behind. The force of attraction between the negatively charged cloud and the positively charged object may be strong enough to cause electrons to jump from the cloud to the object. This will appear as a flash of lightning. Lightning will also occur between the clouds and the earth, or from one top of a cloud to the bottom of another. When the polarization of charge on a thundercloud becomes large enough, it has to be neutralized by discharging. This is what we see as lightning. Scientists have actually made lightning machines to try and reproduce lightning on a smaller scale. Lightning usually strikes objects that are tall and isolated, like the top of a tall tree or the tops of mountains or tall buildings. This is because they can easily become charged by induction as we have already seen. So I think you can clearly see why it isn't a good idea to stand underneath a tall tree during a lightning storm. Not only does the force of a lightning strike split trees apart, but the heat produced by the lightning causes fires.
The air in the path of lightning can be heated up to temperatures of 54,000 degrees Celsius. No wonder lightning causes so many fires. So even if a person is not hit directly, he or she could be killed by the heat produced by the lightning. It's the heat produced by the lightning that makes the noise we call thunder. The heat causes the air to expand very rapidly. The sudden expansion of air makes a rumbling sound. When we are far away from a thunderstorm, we might not see the lightning flashing from cloud to cloud or from a cloud to the earth, but we can still hear the sound. A way of protecting buildings and homes from lightning was developed by Benjamin Franklin. We call this a lightning conductor. A lightning conductor consists of a thick copper strip fixed to the outside wall of a building and which is attached to one or more sharp metal spikes. The spikes are positioned above the highest point of the building. The copper strip is also connected to a metal plate which is buried under the ground. This earths the lightning conductor. Then a negatively charged thundercloud passes over the lightning conductor. The metal spikes become positively charged by the induction. There will be a very strong electric field surrounding the tips of the metal spikes because the charge is so highly concentrated there. The strength of the electric field affects air particles between the metal spikes and the thundercloud. The air particles become positively and negatively charged. Positively charged air particles are attracted to the thundercloud and are neutralized by the negatively charged electrons in it. Negatively charged air particles are attracted to the positively charged metal spikes and become discharged as the electrons jump onto the metal spikes and travel to Earth. If lightning does strike a building that is protected by a lightning conductor, the electrons will take the quickest path to the Earth, jumping onto the metal spikes and then traveling down the copper strip to the metal plate in the ground. Instead of striking the building itself, the lightning will have been harmlessly conducted to Earth. As you can see, lightning has an awful lot of energy and it would be great if we could capture and store this energy. But lightning is extremely unpredictable and is much too dangerous to play around with. It's possible, however, to store static electricity. In 1745, a scientist developed a device that could trap and store charge. It was called the Leyden jar after the Dutch town where the experiments took place. Leyden jars were used a great deal in 18th century electrical experiments. During this period, electrical demonstrations became a popular form of entertainment, when gunpowder and alcohol were ignited by electrical spark discharges. Nowadays, the Leyden jar is simply a teaching tool. It was also the start of capacitor technology. Capacitators are modern storage devices for electrical charges. They are complex and far more advanced than the Leyden jar, but they all share something in common. They all consist of two conductors separated by a non-conductor or insulator. Sadly, this brings us to the end of our series on electrostatics. But before I go, here's one last task for you. You are going to do some research. Find a storyteller or a sangoma and ask him or her to tell you about a traditional explanation for lightning. You need to ask the following questions. Where does lightning come from? How do we protect ourselves against lightning? Try to arrange that you present your findings to your class in the form of a short oral presentation. Join us again soon for some more exciting physics topics here on Mindset Learn. Goodbye.